Welcome to Canadian Justice. I'm Christine Van Gyne, and today we're discussing some recent changes to pandemic restrictions in Canada. Some provinces are relaxing certain restri restrictions. For example, Ontario has reopened restaurants and relaxed gathering restrictions. Saskatchewan and Alberta have both announced plans to soon end their vaccine passport program. And Manitoba has announced the relaxation of some gathering limits. However, other provinces have extended health restrictions, including British Columbia, where proof of vaccination has been extended into March. Nova Scotia extended restrictions into February, and Quebec even briefly contemplated a tax or fine on unvaccinated people. These are quite different reactions in the face of the Omicron variant, which appears to be far more transmissible and also evasive of vaccines. What will the future look like in Canada? How long should we expect restrictions to remain in place? What criteria might courts consider when examining whether these restrictions continue to be reasonable and justified? Here to today to discuss this are two legal experts. Stefan Serafin is an assistant professor from the University of Ottawa, and Ryan Alford is a professor at the Lakehead University Boralaskan Law School. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Um, now we're two years into the pandemic, and it seems like the restrictions in some places are quite severe. Um, we have gathering restrictions, vaccine passports, masking. What, in your view, I'll start with you, Professor Alford, what is it going to take for this to end? I think it's going to take a different level of risk perception from the public. I think that as soon as people start to internalize um, the data and the awareness that Omicron is very different from Delta and from original COVID, and that given infection fatality rates and case fatality rates, are roughly congruent to influenza, that uh, treating the disease as endemic and using normal measures to, to treat the populace rather than emergency measures are far more appropriate. Uh, Professor Serafin, your take, what's it, what's it gonna take to end this? I, I agree with, uh, with Professor Alford. It's a question of public perception primarily. Um, and I'd add to what he, he said already, one, another thing that people are going to have to accept, I think, is that we're all gonna get this. I mean, recently, uh, I didn't know anybody who had had COVID personally. I actually knew a few people only until last month. And now quite a few people I know have had the Omicron variant. Um, and I think we're just going to have to accept that we're going to get this. I'm expecting to get it in the next week or two, right? <laughs> Probably my kids are in school. Uh, and once people do that, I think the perception of this uh, whole uh, pandemic is going to change. Uh, yeah, I'm one of those people who got it in at Christmas, so it, it wasn't it wasn't very pleasant. Uh, but you know, luckily I'm a, I'm a healthy person and I'm I'm vaccinated. Um, Professor Serafin, why are provinces taking such different approaches? Is it about different risk profiles in these different places, or is it political? And to the extent that it's political, how does a political choice play into uh, a legal justification for a policy? I mean, that's a good question. I, I tend to think that it is primarily political in the sense that, and there's different legal cultures, like if you think of Quebec, which has probably had the worst, or not worst, but the most extreme response, if you will, to the pandemic, the legal culture is far more prone to this type of government intervention. Um, and then, you know, so long as that's part of the equation, places that have less of a political tolerance for uh, pandemic restrictions, I think are going to just have uh, lesser restrictions in place. It ties back to the whole thing of this being about public perception fundamentally. Um, the question is, fund is then what does this mean for the legal case if we ever try to challenge these provisions? And I think from like a perspective of section one justification, um, the public's perception doesn't necessarily, um, it, it should not be determinative at the very least. Uh, there's a question of, you know, sure, we need to tolerate and we need to accept divergent policy responses in different provinces. But at the same time, those responses have to be grounded in some actual, you know, uh, proper assessment of what the risk actually entails. Professor Alford, we've got about 40 seconds. Your, your take. Precisely right. If Saskatchewan abandons all restrictions and we see that hospitalization rates do not skyrocket in Saskatchewan, it has profound implications for how we would view the constitutionality of restrictions in provinces like Quebec. I mean, different provinces also do have different hospital capacity, so I think that we should we should take that into account as well. Um, there's a lot of things that a, a court would consider. Um, when we come back from this commercial break, I'm going to ask you 
both about some of those restrictions in Quebec that Professor Serafin mentioned, uh, which have been some of the most extreme. We will be right back. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing what's it going to take to end COVID restrictions in Canada. Now, Professor Serafin, I want to turn to you with this example of, of Quebec. Quebec has expanded their vaccine passport program to liquor and cannabis stores, as well as to big box stores, so Walmart, Costco. And, and with respect to big box stores, unvaccinated shoppers must now be accompanied to ensure that they're only shopping for essential goods like pharmacy items or groceries. Do you have concerns about some of these policies, the, the, the big box and the, the liquor cannabis store um, restrictions from a, a policy perspective or a legal perspective? Well, I mean, both. Um, the big box measures uh, are probably the most uh, questionable, I think, uh, just because you're letting people into the store uh, and there, there's no, I don't think there's any evidence that they present any less risk just because they're going to shop for certain items versus others. I mean, the, the policy of reason for this, of course, is that we don't want to prevent people from purchasing certain essential items. But to the extent you're letting them into the store, I do wonder, you know, whether there's a case that can be made that for this to actually protect anybody's safety in any uh, meaningful way. Now, pr Professor Alford, do you have a take on that? I do. And just with respect to liquor stores, the policy is unbelievably uh, short-sighted. Um, you're talking about people who need to access alcohol because of dependency in particular. And um, some of those people have very little in the way of ID. There are also people who are not likely to have much contact with the bureaucracy and the government. Um, and if those people don't get the level of alcohol to which they're habituated, which could be a liter of vodka every day, you're talking about a guaranteed hospital bed being taken out of service and being devoted to someone having uh, withdrawal and delirium tremens. And the, the perception on the part of the public that uh, liquor stores should be part of this policy because they're not essential is, uh, is incredibly short-sighted. A really important perspective. Uh, Professor Alfred, I wanna ask you about this other Quebec policy that, that was proposed and then they backtracked. Um, it was a tax or penalty fine on people who were unvaccinated. It was extremely controversial and the government ended up backing down because they acknowledged it was divisive. What are your thoughts on that policy as a, from a policy and both legal perspective? Well, starting with policy, it makes it fairly clear that what we were always talking about is mandatory vaccination, that the fig leaf we've been hiding behind is that everyone is choosing voluntarily to get vaccinated so that they can keep their jobs, so that they can fly on planes, so that they can uh, access um, many different types of facilities. And as soon as it became clear that this is we're moving beyond the fig leaf and we're saying, well, if you don't do it, you're going to receive a financial penalty, um, the constitutional implications of this became clear. And I think that a lot of people, including Julius Gray, a constitutional lawyer in Quebec, pointed out that there would probably be a constitutional challenge. And importantly, I think that that constitutional challenge would require the government to make arguments about efficacy, about the rationality, about minimal impairment that we're going to discuss today. And I don't think they really would want an airing in court of all of those issues, particularly at this point in the pandemic. So discretion may have been the better part of valor. Uh, Professor Serafin, your take on that as well. And one of the things I'm most interested in is Quebec has a very high vaccine rate, very high, one of the highest in Canada. Um, and with the, the, the ability of the Omicron variant to evade vaccines, what was this policy actually intended to achieve? I mean, how much would it actually have reduced transmission among a small group of unvaccinated people when it, the virus actually transmits among the vaccinated as well? I think I think at this point, uh, and I'm not up to date on exactly what the most recent studies are saying, but I think the case for encouraging people and potentially applying punitive measures to encourage them further to get vaccinated can only be made really on the basis that it reduces hospitalization rates. And from what I gather, that is still the case. So if you are double vaccinated, then you are much less likely to develop serious symptoms and end up in the hospital beds. Uh, I think that's probably where the Quebec government would have tried to make its case on this if it had proceeded further. It's probably where it's still going to try to make its case if the other uh, vaccination policies are challenged. 
Now, Professor Alford, we've got about 30 seconds. Your view on these increasingly severe policies um, in, in the places that have the highest vaccine rates? Well, the problem is that the messaging was all about herd immunity being reached at a 60 or a 70 percent of, of vaccinated groups. And that was consistent. We saw it across provinces and across time. And having to resile from that is really harming public confidence and public health measures. Now, vaccination is, is a great choice for most people to make. I'm vaccinated. I encourage people to speak to their doctor about vaccination. But certainly, it seems like there's a lot more going on here um, with, with some of these policies. And, and they're treading into, in my opinion, the territory of becoming punitive to people who disagree with mainstream viewpoints. We will be right back. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing what it's going to take legally and from a policy perspective to end COVID restrictions. Um, one of the things I want to ask you both about is vaccine passports. We're seeing some provinces end them. We're, for example, Saskatchewan and Alberta have announced they want to end them. But BC has extended their vaccine passport. Um, what do you think is going to take to end that policy? And is it going to be incremental? For example, could it remain required for some places, but not others, like in areas uh, like long-term care facilities where the risk is higher, but not required in perhaps lower risk settings like restaurants? Oh, sorry, Professor Alfred, you can start. <laughs> <laughs> so your last question, I think they're going to try to manage the perception that things are being phased out in a very prudent way. So I can see LTCs and other facilities being the last to go. Um, the question that we have to ask is, if people are willing to have uh, rapid antigen tests, um, what, what purpose does it serve to have a vaccine passport? Uh, and the, the real problem that we have constitutionally, particularly with respect to BC, is that there are people who very much want to visit elderly relatives in long-term care facilities. They're allergic to polyethylene glycol. They can't get a COVID vaccine. Uh, sorry, um, Professor Al Alfred, what, what, would, what would the allergy, what, what's that in, in? Well, there are certain rare medical conditions that prevent vaccination. Okay. And in the event of BC, there's no provision for people who have established that they meet these uh, stringent conditions for demonstrating the rare medical exemption, can have an exemption to the vaccine passport. So with respect to long-term care facilities, if that's the last place to require them, you're putting the residents of those long-term care facilities in a terrible situation where they can't be visited by a caregiver. And not only is that unconstitutional, it's terribly cruel. And, and it also would have an impact on the rights of those, those individuals in, in the care homes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think that's quite right. We, we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, abstract away from the fact that vaccine passports harm far more than the people who have medical exemptions or have human rights exemptions and are not being honored. Professor Serafin, what about masking requirements? Do you think that's maybe going to be the last thing to go? Are we going to be wearing masks for a long time? Um, and what might it take for for mask requirements to be removed? And, and like vaccine passports, might it happen incrementally? I, I think it'll have to happen incrementally because it, it, people are at this point used to wearing them. Even I put them on, you know, just by force of habit now. Uh, and there's this sort, sort of like, it's like a safety blanket for, uh, for people almost when they go out, they wear masks. So uh, if you start, uh, if you don't do this incrementally, then I think that they're going to get some backlash from uh, certain people who don't feel safe going outside. Uh, and so, um, you know, masking in schools, even, uh, even though it looks like there's no actual benefit to masking small children in schools, uh, I suspect we're going to have this policy around for uh, at least a little while yet. And, and what might it take to, to finally end that? What are the criteria that the government might be using to, to continue to have a policy like this? Truthfully, I'm not sure what the criteria in support of masking are at this point, uh, especially in the school setting. So uh, that is a very good question, and I wish I had an answer. Pro Professor Alfred, I want to ask about another restriction, which are the restrictions on our borders. Um, there have been these have changed significantly throughout the pandemic, from um, having a period where we had these quarantine hotels to now having to show proof of vaccination to travel. What do you think, uh, how long do you think these border restrictions might remain in place and what might it take for us to say finally, you know, this is done, we're a free and open country again? 
this is really going to be the longest lasting because once these get in place, they get put into um, protocols and systems that are really transnational. So you have a system whereby, for instance, in Europe, everything's being coordinated through the European Union. It's so difficult to dismantle things once they've been put into place. There's nothing more temporary than a, uh, a, a, a there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government measure, as they say. Uh, so I think it's going to take a lot of pushback from the public. And insofar as you see a situation where things are rapidly normalized in every segment of society, um, whether or not the airport can remain uh, somewhat different from the rest of that, well, I will say that in the United States, people are still taking off their shoes. So uh, I'm a little more pessimistic than optimistic. So, Professor Alfred, in 30 seconds, you think the border restrictions will remain in place longer than masking requirements then? I do. And I think that it's going to be a very strange situation given the patchwork. It may be very different if you're going to Mexico than going to Europe, for instance. And and um, just to close that off, which which do you think will be the, the last to go based on justifiability, uh, Professor Serafin? I think the border measures are probably going to be the last to go based on justifiability as well. Uh, I mean, there there is an... We, we've got to go to commercial break, but we will be right back. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing what it's going to take from a policy and legal perspective to end COVID restrictions. Uh, Professor Serafin, why is it that some of these measures keep getting renewed and extended? We're no longer in a declared state of emergency, and a lot of these measures are not even legislated. They are imposed by regulation or by order of unelected public health officials. Do you have views on whether these measures um, should have clear time limits, like sunset clauses, and clear criteria about what's required to end restrictions? In the last segment we talked about, we, we just don't know what the criteria will be to end these, these restrictions. Um, yeah, well, the answer is yes, I do. <laughs> uh, the measure should be subject to sunset clauses. And I think that one of the biggest issues that we've had is just communication of what the different measures uh, involve and what it will take to remove the measures once they're in place. And I think public confidence in particular uh, would have benefited from clear guidelines on these points from right from the get-go, frankly. Yeah, two years to flatten the curve, right? Um, Professor Alford, do you have an opinion on, on, on this, the lack of clear criteria and the lack of clear time limits? Well, it's shameful. In Ontario, we have a statutory framework under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. It had all of these requirements for sunset clauses, it had requirements for justifiability, and it was thought out as a clear policy response to SARS, that in every emergency, you need to be tied to the mass like Odysseus, because if, you, if you're not, you're gonna take whatever measure appears to be justified in the heat of the moment. And then, you know, sin in haste, repent at leisure. So these durable protections that are supposed to prevent the government from governing by fiat were bypassed completely. And the Ford government says, well, rather than relying upon what we worked out in the cool, clear light of dawn after coming to our senses after the last emergency, we're going to depart from that entirely and make it up as we go along with a new legislative framework. This was with the Reopening Ontario Act, correct, where they extended the emergency measures without having an, a declared state of emergency. For two years. And to, to allow for them to evade legislative responsibility entirely, because what it allows you to do is to say, well, this is what the experts think. But there, there are no experts in these trade offs. There are no experts in whether or not denying someone access to their dying relative in a hospital or a long term care facility. It can be justified by you know, lowering an R value. Really, really important point. Uh, Professor Serafin, I want to ask you, do you think that the past two years will have a lasting impact on how much government intrusion into our lives the public is going to tolerate in the future? Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, whether that's a good thing or not is, is another matter, but I think the answer has to be yes. We've gotten used to this idea that the government should legislate or adopt, in fact, not even legislate, should adopt policies uh, to protect us from any sort of perceived risk, right? And we're already seeing this in the United States, where now they're talking about, you know, increasing road regulations to decrease the amount of death that's occurring on the roads, right? Whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, all of this comes out of the sort of lessons learned from the COVID experience. Professor Alford, your take on that same question. 
they're going to have to decide what they want from government. And the caution that we typically give people is a government that's strong enough to protect you from everything that you fear is also strong enough to take away everything that you have. And sometimes they do. What in the in the last minute, Professor Alfred, there have been some legal challenges to these measures, but success has been sort of at the margins. Are courts the right avenue for response, or does this require a governmental solution, a, a change in leadership, perhaps? Well, history tells us that courts are always very reticent to disturb emergency measures in the heat of the moment. They're just under tremendous pressure. Um, and they're asked to take at face value the notion that if they were to uphold constitutional rights, they'd be putting a lot of people at risk. And that's a very difficult position to be in as a judge, you know, do justice should the heavens fall. So I think that when the climate changes and people's uh, perception changes, uh, I think we'll see a, a bit of a change in how it's dealt with in the courts. But hopefully the legislature takes the lead on this. Well, I want to thank you both so much for coming on today to share your perspective. I hope that uh, everyone remains healthy, that the case rates and death rates go down, and that we finally do get to reopen. We've heard today about recent changes to COVID measures across Canada, with some provinces extending health measures and other provinces relaxing them. What will it take for these restrictions to finally conclude? Is the end in sight, or is this our new normal? And should legislation be changed to make the criteria for imposing restrictions more reviewable and time limited and conditional in the future? You be the judge. Thanks for watching. And remember, a freer Canada starts with you.